Welcome to the SDA Housing Podcast, brought to you by NDIS Property Australia. Before starting this episode, we need to provide a general disclaimer. Information contained in this podcast is general in nature only. It does not take into account the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. You need to consider your financial situation and needs before making any decisions based on the information in this podcast. And you should consider seeking independent and professional advice for your personal circumstances. All right, let's begin. Hello, everybody. My name is Debbie from NDIS Property Australia, and you're listening to the SDA Housing Podcast, a show that explains, highlights, guides, and brings awareness about all things SDA in this ever-changing NDIS world. We have a special guest speaker with us today, Stephen Fakeney from Hilltop Caring. Welcome, Stephen. Hi, Deb. Great to be here. Great to have you. You're a brand new podcast interviewee. So uh, yeah, very cool to have you on board. We have obviously been in contact with each other a number of times over, I guess, the last year or so. I'm not sure. At least, yeah. Yeah, more. And uh, so yeah, we thought that you have a, a very important role in the NDIS housing world and support world, and would be really useful to get your insights into uh, how things are looking out there from your perspective. So firstly, can you tell us who Hilltop Caring are? Oh, absolutely. Hilltop Caring are a service provider. Hilltop Caring's, I've been around for about five or six years, and I guess they entered the space really focusing on providing nursing support. So the directors of the company come from a nursing background and just felt that was the natural uh, entry point. Over Over that time, It's evolved into, uh, based on the demand, we still provide some nursing support, but it really has become focused very much on accommodation, SIL, SDA, MTA, STA, the lot. So I'd say right now, our biggest focus is on quality SIL support in accommodation. Okay, great. So you said that you've been in the field for a while. Tell us about your journey. How did you, uh, I know you've, you've been with other organizations, but how did you end up, yeah, where you are now? Yeah. So I've been in the sector probably for a little over 20 years now. And in that time, I've, I've I guess, uh, the majority of that time working in the disability area, mostly focused, I mean, it started, I, I absolutely started in, in disability employment. But for the majority of that 20 years, it has it tended to be around accommodation. I spent some time involved in uh, building uh, SIL properties uh, for an organization. Um, I obviously wasn't the builder, but I was involved in that team that uh, built purpose-built housing that's prior to the NDIS. And it was involved in the move through, move into the NDIS. So it was a very exciting time, but I've, I've, I've always had a passion for accommodation and housing and homes because it's not, it's not so much about the, the bricks and mortar, but I always believe you, if you really want to support somebody, the first thing they've got to have is a stable home. And I guess over the years, that has led me through a couple of different organizations and I've landed with Hilltop Caring, who I've Prior to coming to Hilltop, I'd certainly known them for for many years, and I just saw the, I guess the the values of the organisation being very focused on the quality of care and and not on things such as growth and uh, I guess the dollars. I mean, obviously they're important, but number one focus is always on. The quality of care. So that's what's led me to here. And the fact that they're very focused on, have been very focused on accommodation has certainly, I guess, grabbed my attention. Fantastic. So you did touch on what Hilltop, Hilltop Caring do, obviously yeah. predominantly SIL supports within accommodations. Uh, obviously that covers SIL homes, SDA homes, and as you mentioned, you do MTA, STA as well. Do you do other services or is it just pretty much the, the care, the in, in-home care? 
Yeah, we do. We absolutely do a few other services. As I mentioned, we do a. Uh, we still provide some nursing support. Uh, we also provide some my age care services. So, but I'd say they're predominantly. And of course, we do the things that go with support. So we do community access and and ho- and we do definitely have taken people on holidays and things like that. But but what we've done is the I would say the majority of our time is spent around the accommodation space and and what comes with that when you when you're caring for people twenty four hours a day you end up you know you are responsible for everything in their life so you want to make that as comfortable and as yeah you want it as warm as possible and I guess that's the focus that we've had is how do we make people. Uh, feel like it's their home, which it is, and not feel like we're imposing on them. Because we really want people to to have the best quality of life that they possibly can. That is a really valid point. You know, we don't really think about that often when we're thinking about accommodation for NDIS participants. We're thinking, yeah, they 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 have their own home, they've got the choice and control there, they've got the supports coming in. But sometimes you forget that they've they've got to have all those other things that are going on in the home that that help them feel like it is their own home. Absolutely. Their space. And, you know, we, you know, we understand too, and as everyone does, that when you start thinking about, um, say, a traditional uh, three-participant home, you know, that's a, sh- that's a shared home. So that when you have that three, three participants living together, that is going to come with all the same things that we would have experienced perhaps growing up living in a shared home, in a shared environment. You know, so those challenges of, you know, making sure that one, people are suited to each other personality-wise, that they have activities that they can do together as well as by themselves, and that it just you know, it adds that element of you've got to you've got to work really hard to make it feel like their home because it's a shared home. I mean, not to say that that's the only model that we have. We we certainly do uh, like the single occupancy villas and and the units and the concierge for for independent living. But I would say, from my perspective, that when you've got a shared home, it actually adds another element that you've got to think about. Oh yeah. gosh, absolutely, yeah. For certainly when when you know we're considering SDA, a lot of investors come and and they are just thinking about the income and obviously that means they want the the largest time they can fit the maximum number of participants in and it, it it's always part of the education process that we're telling them look, you know, this is someone's forever home. They've there's going to be so many more complexities around finding compatible people to live together. It's not just that they are sharing for a couple of years as as we would have done, you know, leaving home and, and moving in with flatmates and whatnot because, uh, you know, you're going to be moving on soon. This is a very different situation, a very different scenario and and often why we, we say a good option for an SDA investor is to consider single occupancy apartments or whatnot because that complication of of finding matching Tenants for a share home is taken out because it is such a complex thing to do. You're not just matching the the personalities. You also got to match their care requirements, and and that's a whole nother level of difficulty. It is, and one of the best things about, I mean, the SDA space, and is that now we're seeing a lot more good quality homes being built with that in mind. So you know, a three participant home will ha- at least have those two separate living areas. And um, maybe an outdoor covered area, like a pergola area where uh, people can, so they've got plenty of choices of where they spend their time. And we're starting to see more now, particularly in some of the lower levels, the fully accessible and the um, improved livability um, homes, we're now starting to see investors thinking about making sure each bedroom has an ensuite rather than at the beginning where we were seeing just the two two bathrooms, maybe. So yeah, it is definitely growing and developing and we're seeing a lot of very positive moves in that space for SDA and 
And we're even starting to see some SDA developers, uh, approach, like I, I get calls from SDA developers wanting to potentially build SIL properties, so non-SDA. And that's something we've been talking about and, and trying to get happening for so many years, but we're starting to see that happen now because particularly with the housing crisis and, and all those things, this, we've put a lot of effort into the SDA space, but it's getting harder for a provider from our perspective to find those, those non-SDA SIL homes or those apartments and those sorts of things. So it is, it is certainly. Yeah. And that's yeah. really important because, I mean, you know, SDA, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of SDA participants out there in Australia. The number's currently sitting at about 22,000. But if you look at SIL participants, and yes, SDA participants will in almost every case have SIL funding as well. But there's a lot of participants that don't have S, don't need SDA that do have SIL. I think we uh, we've got about thirty one thousand participants across the country who've got SIL. So you know that's another big lot of people that often get forgotten about in terms of their housing. Uh, it, it absolutely is, and and look, maybe you know some of the interpretations of the review, the NDIS review recently, it, uh, does indicate that there may be some move to to help in that area. True and. You know, that may be what, what we see. We may see some, I guess, amalgamation, not amalgamation, but some connection between the removal or change, as they say, of the improved livability stage with non-SDA or, or some kind of other program in there, which would be great to mm -hmm. see. That would assist SIL participants because it is getting hard. There's no public housing out there. We know the average is a 10-year wait. So, you know, it is great. We are seeing some developers, I mean, maybe not on a big scale, but we're starting to see providers take advantage of the the properties that are uh, being built at the moment, particularly in Queensland for things like, um, and everyone has a different term for this, but those micro unit style properties where it looks like a like, house. Like a rooming house. Yeah, kind of. But there's, it's like far, it's like, um, you know, three, four, five self-contained studios in Side a yep. house. Um, yeah, now at yeah. the moment yep. they're not being built for disability, but they're being built for the open market. And look, there's definitely something that can be built on there. So, oh, for sure. Yeah. There's, yeah. I'm hearing more and more about that kind of development coming out at the moment. Yeah. It, it's often called a rooming house. Yeah. Used a lot for, I guess, um, students or, or FIFO workers or, or people that just, you know, have long commutes that, that want to sort of stay closer to work during the weekday so they don't have to travel every day. But yeah, you're right. That would be a really great model for, for disability housing as well. Yeah, it absolutely would. I'd say, I'd say in the SDA space though, at the moment, I'd say the, there's a good amount of uh, property out there and we're seeing some, some amazing builds coming off the production line. So now, now the challenge for, for providers is always, and, and I'm sure for everyone else, is finding the right property in the right location at the right time. And, and we've yep. seen that with, with areas such as, I guess, the outer suburbs of the Gold Coast, where at the moment it's really hard to find a house. Pretty easy to find an apartment, but very hard to find a house. And whereas two years ago, everyone was building in those areas and then yeah. moved, moved that, on. That brings to me to the, yeah, the conversation we, we've been having over the last couple of weeks. You did approach us and I know you were talking to every SDA provider you could find you needed a fully vacant house on the north yeah. gold coast you'd or you need and there's a lot of housing on the gold coast and there's a lot of vacancy but there's not a whole house that's vacant you know there'll be one or two rooms vacant in a house but you need the entire property so yeah this is this leads me and you mentioned the word challenges and i want to talk more about what other challenges are you are you dealing with at the moment Look, I'd absolutely say that's probably the biggest challenge is, is not, not that one particular, but, you know, there are areas, it's, it's, again, the right place in the right, the right, the right property available in the right location. And, and look, it's always been a bit of a jigsaw puzzle when it comes to that sort of thing. But, you know, it's not, in, it's, there, there's definitely property, but it's finding it. A, a good example is Ipswich. Ipswich was flooded with property. More so the inner suburbs. Uh, so about a year ago, it was flooded with property. Uh, there's still property available, but it's harder to find in those suburbs now. So we can see that market changing. 
but then we're also seeing a resurgence in demand. And I think I think they're probably the biggest challenges from our perspective. Uh, we get the demand. We've got a fairly long waiting list for participants, participants wanting accommodation in particular areas. So we, we're absolutely, we're, that's a mixture of both SDA participants and SIL participants. Uh, this, so it can be a bit of a challenge, but, you know, ultimately, you know, we have a focus on if a participant comes to us looking for whether it's a property or for service in general, we're not going to just throw them into any property. So it's, there's got to be exceptional client matching. So even if we've got a vacancy in Logan somewhere and someone's looking for something in Logan, when if it's not the right participant match, we're not going to do that. Well, so we're no going point. No. Yeah. And and you know, we we quite often get calls for new properties and uh to take on new properties. But again, we we're not gonna rush into something like that because we wanna make sure that we have the team in place before we move into something because if you go and open a house and then worry about having the right team, you're going to be more, you're going to get more concerned with filling the house or doing the, you know, uh, rushing. And it may not be the right team because you're, you know, you're in that, I guess that rush. So what we do is we make sure we, we get the team in place for a region for that particular area. And we have enough staff to do that. And then we go and look for the property. So, Do you find that's a challenge as well as staffing? It is funny. Look, throughout my time in the industry, it was always a challenge. I'm saying, I, I would say right now, we're not finding that a huge challenge. There's, we're always looking for, for good staff, but we've been very fortunate that we, I guess, our existing, I would say 100%, 90 to 100% of our staff that come through have been referred by existing staff. So we have mm -hmm. that steady stream of new staff coming through. And being that they've uh, often come from recommendations of existing staff, you know, that adds an element of comfort as well for us. Yeah. Mm, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I just want to talk more about this mismatch of of properties. Yeah. And this is kind of like the the, the big catch-22 we have in this industry is, is people are building, they're developing, but they're not building where the demand is. But how do you know where the demand is? We know that specifically for SDA, the data that comes out is, is outdated. It's not necessarily that accurate. We don't know, you know, the future demand where it's actually going to go. There's, there's all these indications and that's kind of all we've got to go on. And, and you're right because the other thing, the other big element that we, I, I can see is that, you know, you have, what the demand is today is not going to be the same as what the demand is 9, 12, 18 months when that property is completed. So. Oh yeah. We have seen this all the time. Yeah. So that, that I absolutely can see that. And, you know, I got approached a week ago about a property out just slightly out of town uh, on the Warrego Highway, which is between, for the for listeners, between Brisbane and Toowoomba. And it's a beautiful property. It would suit everything. But the owner um, of that property hasn't currently been able to, to fill it. And it is, it's because I, I would say maybe 12 months ago to like two years ago, there was some demand for that area. But right now when the property's sitting there, the demand isn't there. So it really is that uh, juggling act and that jigsaw that you've got to put together and get as much, get the word out as much as possible about where the properties are. I try to get involved with SDA providers um, six months before a property is completed to at least get, to, to at least start getting the word out there that, you know, we're built, it's, it's bit, there's a property being built in this area. Mm. Let's see that's, if we can. I mean, that's absolutely interest. what we do as well. We yeah. say to all of our investors, you know, once the slab goes down, once the once the building is obviously actually going ahead, that's the time to start yeah. because it is just such a slow process. People think it's just okay. There's all these participants that need a house; it'll be easy to find them. Well, and absolutely. <laughs> and I guess I guess the other challenge that's happening at the moment, 
is where you know you as as everybody in the industry knows it can take nine months, twelve months to to see a home and living application process. So I guess that's the other delay that you can experience. You might today have someone who's applying for SDA wants that area, but by the time their application is processed in nine months or twelve months, the you know either the prop the property is not completed, it's been filled or whatever that that is but that is a challenge so the speed at which things happen it's not it's not a fast moving industry we we we're busy but it's oh, not a sure. fast mo- <laughs> moving yeah so yeah but in terms of where where to build it is really hard you know i've heard that you know there's an abundance of sda property for example in the Morton region, uh, around Caboolture and those areas, there's quite a bit of property available, but the demand has sort of dropped off. And 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 as you were saying, there was another example that came up the other day where there's an abundance. I think every investor has built in somewhere like Townsville. So there's now yeah. an oversupply in that area. Now that that will you know, that will work itself out in due course, but it may take considerable amount of time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Because we know that the numbers are only going to continue to go up. Absolutely. And and I, I, it won't happen in every case, but in some cases, there may also be a shift when participants can't find suitable housing where they need it. There, some potentially may move quite a considerable distance to where the housing is there. I, I you know, I don't know how often that would happen. But it's it's just a real, as I said, it's a real catch-22 and I don't know what the answer is, you know. It would be ideal if we could we could say, okay, this participant needs SDA, let's get their funding applied for, let's start building them a house and somehow have the two connected. It just cannot work that way. I, I don't know how it could possibly be made to work that way. And there are cases where, where uh, an SDA developer gets involved in building for a specific person because they it, have it that does time. It on the rare occasion, but for every, what I'm saying, every single participant yeah. so that we have exactly the right yeah. match. But it, it just can't be done. No, it can't. And the other thing, I mean, the statistics that are put out, like you said, they're not always accurate. They give a good indication sometimes. But one of the things that we've seen, and I, I think um, probably, I don't remember how long ago, but I was listening to to your podcast. And it had a guest on who was talking about the oversupply in the Logan area. It was probably six or 12 months ago. And I remember thinking the one thing with the statistics, because the statistics stated that there'd been an oversupply in the Logan area at that point in time. But the funny thing is, from observational perspective, is it doesn't take into account that what we're seeing is a lot of people actually wanting to relocate to the Logan area. They're, they're happy to come down to that area in Queensland, and and you can't account for that. So people willing to migrate, yeah, and that's so a, yeah, yeah, it is it is very hard. It's a guessing game, and I guess that's in some respects why we we're seeing in in key areas more developers looking at apartments. I uh, maybe there's maybe mm-hmm. there's a little bit little bit of a, a lower risk. Of who you know filling some of those because they're they're more I guess closer to metro areas or closer to key areas. That's right, transport shops, yeah. other facilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and just for those people that have grown up in in the more inner suburban areas, they don't want to move to the Ipswiches and the Logans. They want to stay, you know, within a five k radius of the city or whatever. And yeah, that's where we're seeing apartments um, really, and also the fact that you know, in most cases, they're single tenancy, and and knowing that whilst they may not be funded for it, a lot of participants wish to live on their own. And you know, we're even seeing we've got an apartment, com- uh, some apartments coming available soon in for Brisbane listeners, the Nunda area. But it's interesting because we're getting a lot of inquiries about that. But it, I think part of the metro thing is it's as you were saying, is it's close. We're getting demand from hospitals. So the for hospital discharge, because a lot of the hospitals you do find are in relatively metro areas, or there's an abundance of them. So you you do see you do see people wanting to, I guess, discharge from hospital and stay in those close to that hospital. So mm-hmm. you know, so I do see that. But 
Yeah, there is certainly, I, I saw some beautiful apartments being advertised the other day on, I th- believe it was on the Gold Coast and they were stunning apartments. So, I mean, they are, they are beautiful. But it's just, uh, unfortunately, the apartments don't suit everybody. That's yeah. right, yeah. And not everybody wants to live in an apartment. They want to have a backyard. They do want to have a share house and have company a yes. little more time. So, you know, it's it's so individual. And, yeah, it's it's, it's just being such a, a relatively small cohort, it is a really difficult thing. And that's definitely the biggest challenge that we're also facing is – is firstly from the on the development side of it initially is is people want guarantees of tenancy is absolutely no way that we can you know guarantee at all we can we can give the best chance of assuring best best chance of assuring tenancy by certain things like building the best possible design in the best possible location future proofing it etc cetera, etc cetera. but you know at the end of the day there's no way you can guarantee because it's just such a movable feast. <laughs> it is. And I know from a development perspective, it's hard because you always got to find the, the land and the land is the hardest thing to find, I think. And and I think we've seen that like development is obviously in a lot of cases being where, you know, that land is available. So the new subdivisions and things like that. And, and we're, you know, and there is a lack of, I guess, new developments uh, closer to metro areas because there is no land no absolutely and, and, and when you do find something yeah when you do find something closer in yeah the issue is that it's it is too expensive and you're not going to get the rental returns to make it a feasible investment option so again another complication another challenge yeah it is and and you know but <laughs> at the same time on sill like with even with sill properties you know they do they do appear at some point they do appear and and it's just staying on top of that. And, you know, we have a team here that is constantly looking for new property for both SIL and SDO. At the moment, the, the issue we have with the Gold Coast one is we've actually got the participants waiting, perfectly matched to each other. It's just finding that property. So, you know, we're even talking to other providers at the moment that might have a single participant in that property about you know, potential models of sharing supports um, amongst the two teams, like working together to provide a service to, say, the three participants and working together to do it. And so we're open to all of those things as well, um, looking at those models and finding the best way to make it work. We're, we're certainly not the kind of provider that, you know, wants to be everything to everyone. We absolutely encourage our participants if they're in one of our properties, we provide them to have a, we, we encourage them to have a, uh, a separate uh, community access provider. We're happy to do that as well, but we feel that if you've got two providers in the mix of providing care to someone, you're going to, like the two teams are going to learn from each other as well. And Sure. And I guess they're going to be keeping each other in check a little too. Yeah. A little bit of that helps too. But uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I love to hear that, you know, you're open to that collaboration with other other care providers in a property because, again, that's a lot of where the complication comes in, in finding enough tenants to fill a property is because that one care provider just doesn't have any other clients yeah. that, on their books or that they can, that they can source. So, yeah, I think, I think, you know, you've got to be open to, we, we promote ourselves in saying that when we talk. We talk about us ourselves being flexible. So our number one concern is to make sure that the quality of care for the participant is the highest it possibly can be. And if that means that we collaborate with someone to do that, then we will do it because we literally just want to have our participants happy and enjoying their life. Mm, yeah, that's what it's all about, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. Okay, so I think um, one last question to round this up. Yeah. What is your vision for the next couple of years for Hilltop Caring, Stephen? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> uh, it's fun- But it's funny that you asked that question because we were only, we're doing some planning, some planning work at the moment. And I guess the vision for Hilltop Caring is to equally focus on our teams, our staff, and our participants to make sure that 
we can provide an opportunity, I guess, for both those those groups to feel empowered and happy in their life. So, uh, but from an organization, uh, like an actual company perspective, where we just want to be able to, I guess, provide what participants are asking for. So if they if if they need accommodation, we'll go and find it. We're trying to we'll go and try and find it. You know, if they want to go on a holiday, we may you know we, we if we can't do that, we'll find somebody who can do that. We our vision is just to I guess make every every one of our participants and our staff I guess feel like they're part of the process and they're part they've got a say in everything that we do so I guess that's that's the vision we absolutely are focused on the accommodation space and and a couple of those other areas we don't want to change that we don't want to become you know get into other services we don't want to uh, become get into support coordination or programs or other areas there are better providers out there doing those services you know they're experts in programs experts uh support coordinator groups we don't want to be a one-stop shop we want to provide a quality service in the things that we do yeah you do it well and you want to continue to improve on what you do well absolutely yeah love you love your ethos there Stephen. well look i think that wraps up everything that yeah I wanted to ask you, and I think that's been an amazing conversation around disability housing in general and the challenges the, the, the industry is facing. So, yeah, thank you very, very much. Have you got any last thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I, look, I'm, I just think you guys have, like, I, as you said, we've been talking for well over a year, probably closer to two years now. And, you know, I, I love the work that, that's going on over at, NDIS Property Australia and well, the, Thank you. and look, you know, I, I certainly pass your details on to the developers that do call me. I tend to get a lot of calls from developers. I'm sure everybody does. And, you know, there are some great, I mean, you guys are not SDA providers, as you always say. So I also pass the, you know, the details on of, of some of the best SDA providers I've come across locally. And there are some fantastic operators here, particularly, you know, we, we, a lot of our SDA property comes from some of the companies out there, like Adapt Housing is one of our favorites, Ever Homes, SDA Australia, uh, SDA Management Australia. They've all provided fantastic service to us over the years. And I'm always happy to pass on their details to the inquiries that we get. But I think just keep doing what you're doing. And I keep hearing about all these exciting new ventures you guys are doing. So I look forward to seeing where that goes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, we're continuously coming up with new ideas to, yeah, benefit the industry, I guess. Yeah, no. So that's what it's all about. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Steve. I really appreciate it. I think that's been a, a great conversation we've had and I hope people get a lot out of it and uh, look forward to catching up with you again soon. Sounds great. Bye. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please make sure you are subscribed and following us so you can keep in the loop with all of our upcoming episodes. We would really appreciate it if you could leave us a five-star rating, a written review, and to share this podcast with those that could benefit. Until next time, catch you on the next episode.